You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is November 28, 2011, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, mastocytosis. Our presenter is Starla Hayward. Starla is a fourth-year medical student at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine. So our first presentation this morning will be by Dr. Uh, Starla Hayward, who's a fourth-year medical student. Uh, she spent a month uh, in the allergy rotation uh, and has agreed to speak with us today about mastocytosis. So let me get your presentation up and started. And um, do you, would you like a keyboard? Here's a, here's a mouse. Okay. Okay, yes, you can use the arrow also to advance the slides. So okay. welcome to Conferences Online Allergy. Mm -hmm. So this talk kind of stems from a patient that I saw in clinic with Dr. Dowling who had a cutaneous form of this disease. Um, so mastocytosis is basically just excessive mass cell accumulation in one or more tissues. And there's um, two major groups, uh, cutaneous, which is the disease that's just limited to the skin, and then systemic, which involves extracutaneous organs uh, with or without the skin involvement. And the most common extracutaneous organ involved is the bone marrow. There are actually, um, even underneath these groups, there are more subgroups of mastocytosis. I didn't go into complete detail of all of them, but um, there's about four different types of the cutaneous manifestation that you can see. Um, and then even with the systemic, there's another four groupings that patients can be classified into. So a little bit of the epidemiology of mastocytosis. It affects males and females equally. Um, there's a little bit of difference between children and adults when you see the disease. In children, 80% will manifest during the first year of life, and most of them will be limited to the skin, um, and they will most likely improve or resolve by adolescence. So if you see the disease in adulthood, it's most often going to be persistent and most likely will be a systemic form of mastocytosis. Um, and then just a little bit of the pathogenesis, that when you see the clinical manifestations, it's basically mediated by um, all of the mast cell mediators that are listed here, the histamine, heparin, um, and the following. But a little bit of the molecular background of the disease, um, the most commonly um, found molecular abnormality is a gain of function mutation, um, or you can also see growth factor expression. So just a little bit more detail on that. Stem cell factor is um, a growth factor that's essential for normal mast cell development and expansion. And it's really kind of the focus of the pathogenesis of this disease. Uh, mast cells express a receptor for stem cell factor called tyrosine kinase C kit receptor. Um, so all hematopoietic stem cells express this, but um, all of them except mast cells lose those, that expression during their maturation. So mast cells actually maintain this expression of this receptor, and that therefore they remain responsive to the SCS throughout the life of the cell. Um, and the mutation most often associated with disease is a gain-of-function mutation in the um, gene KIT, which encodes for the C-KIT receptor. Um, and this gain-of-function mutation actually results in independent activation of the receptor without um, stem cell factor um, initiating it. So this is the most common um, mutation at codon 816, a substitution of valine for aspartate, and it's actually become one of the minor criteria for diagnosing systemic mastocytosis um, because it is so common. It's most often a somatic mutation, and it will cause um, autophosphorylation of the CKIT receptor independent of the ligand SCF, and it induces a constitutive activation of the cascade. So you can get um, different clinical manifestations, the skin manifestations, um, symptoms of mediated release, and then symptoms of the non-cutaneous organ infiltration. So most commonly, the skin manifestation that you see will be um, pruritus. Um, especially after trigger exposure, some of the triggers that they discussed were exercise or exposure to the heat that caused intense itching. Um, you can see flushing or blister formation. The um, 
barrier sign uh, where you get the urticaria and erythema within five minutes of rubbing an affected um, skin, which is what we, um, we're we looking to see in our patient in the clinic. And then um, something I thought was interesting, which I probably wouldn't have thought of, is urticaria is actually uncommon in mastocytosis. So if you have somebody, a patient, who's having the recurrent prominent urticaria, you should actually be looking for something else that they may be allergic to. It's not necessarily um, a manifestation of the mastocytosis. So this is a picture of the sign after you rub. Um, and it can be a skin where there's a skin involvement with lots of mast cells where you maybe don't necessarily have a nodule or a mass, or it can be where the mass is present. So then the symptoms of the mediator release are the things that we're probably most um, accustomed or familiar with, vasodilation, hypotension, flushing, um, the GI symptoms, headache, local anticoagulation, and this can occur as an acute episode or you have a, a severe allergic reaction or what looks like an anaphylactic reaction. And this can occur in the cutaneous and the systemic form. Um, or it can be more of a chronic release of the muscle mediators and you may get more of the GI symptoms. So some of the common triggers of the mediator release, uh, medications, there's a really long list and I didn't list everything, but if you have a patient with mastocytosis, it's important for them to try to avoid all those medications. But NSAIDs um, were on there as well as uh, anesthesia medications. And then physical factors like exercise and heat exposure like we talked about. Um, surgical procedures can induce kind of like a stress reaction and cause uh, the release, alcohol ingestion, infections, emotional, emotional stress, and then uh, beer wasp teams, and then venomous exposures as well. Uh, the non-cutaneous manifestation, um, I guess you would expect it with a, if you have a bone marrow, if it's affecting the bone marrow, you get anemia, thrombocytopenia, and then the effects on the spleen, uh, malabsorption, and as well as lytic foam lesions. So to evaluate a patient that you suspect may have mastocytosis, um, if they have an apparent skin lesion, then you can biopsy it, um, same for tryptase and the C-kit receptor. Um, and then the laboratory data, CBC, LFTs, and serum tryptase. So somebody with um, a systemic mastocytosis, or a, I'm sorry, a cutaneous mastocytosis, you really may not see any abnormalities in their labs. Um, but somebody with systemic, you would expect to see an elevation of the serum tryptase and possibly abnormalities on their blood count and LFTs as well. Um, so as far as examining the bone marrow, in children, it's really not routinely done for probably most of the reasons we discussed earlier. It will most likely resolve. It's usually only a cutaneous form. So unless you suspect um, that they have systemic involvement, then you don't necessarily need to do a bone marrow examination. But if you have an adult with a certain cutaneous form, the urticaria pigmentosa, or anybody really who exhibits systemic signs, then you would want to do bone marrow biopsy and aspiration. So that's basically the gist of it. If you suspect that there may be systemic involvement, then you should examine the bone marrow. So this is just a, um, a chart that kind of looks at the, the tryptase levels. And this is one way that you can kind of determine um, whether or not this is a person that maybe is just having mast cell release or if they actually have a systemic mastocytosis. So the tryptase is a protease produced predominantly in mast cells. Um, the total tryptase is a combination of the mature, active, and immature form. So normal would be uh, 1 to 11.4, and if you have a level greater than 20 on two occasions, it's strongly suggestive of systemic mastocytosis. Um, the mature tryptase is stored in the granule, so you only see an increase in serum if you have mast cell activation. So it's usually normal in systemic mastocytosis, but you can use um, the ratio of total to mature if you have both levels. So somebody who's having a systemic anaphylaxis, um, you're going to see an increase in both total and mature. So your ratio should be, this chart says less than 10. I also read less than 20. Um, but in a systemic mastocytosis, you're going to have elevations of the total. But the mature should be within normal limits. So your ratio will be greater than 20. So that's one way to differentiate, unless they're having an acute reaction. Um, 
which levels will peak at about one hour after an episode, and then they should return to baseline within four hours. So um, to diagnose cutaneous, obviously signs and symptoms, you can see the lesions, and then you can do a biopsy and determine whether or not um, it is mastocytosis. For the systemic, there's a World Health Organization criteria requires one major and one minor or three minor. So that major criterion um, requires uh, either examination of the bone marrow or another extracutaneous organ that should multifocal dense aggregates of greater than 15 mast cells um, detected with its special stain. And then the minor, the two that we kind of talked about, were the serum triptase greater than 20, and then as well as the mutational analysis of the KIT gene showing that specific mutation. Um, and then there are two other minor criteria based on morphology of the mast cells and the bone marrow, as well as um, surface markers CD2 and CD25. So treatment, um, kind of basically the same, looking at cutaneous and systemic mastocytosis. Um, for cutaneous, I know um, the kiddo that we saw in the clinic, they had actually done a, um, they had actually tried to remove the lesion, but it looked like a small amount of the tissue had remained, and so it was persistent. Um, so really there's not a curative therapy, but the treatment is really aimed at controlling their symptoms and improving quality of life. So prepare them for anaphylactic reactions with EpiPen, um, EpiPen teaching, and then trying to avoid those specific trigger, triggers, giving them a list of the medications, um, making sure that whoever is performing their medical or surgical procedures, if they're really necessary, that they um, go through, there's kind of like a checklist uh, to prepare them for those procedures. And then um, patients should be on both H1 and H2 blockers, and then um, anti-leukotrienes if they need for added symptom control. So I basically used up to date for this talk just to kind of go over the basics, but there's lots of detailed information available. <laughs> so oh, very good. Yeah. 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 I always thought it was helpful to remember the uh, the actual mutation eight one six, that's the area code for Kansas City, Missouri. <laughs> so if you ever have a question on the exam about CKED and you look and there's num different numbers, mm -hmm. I don't know that the boards would ever get that picky. Well, they might get that picky. <laughs> What's the number of the mutation? If you notice that the area code for Kansas City is there, then you'll know. It's good. I mean, I don't know. Is there one that has a 913? That would be really awful. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about Conferences Online Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.